Get ready to open your mind and your heart with Melissa Billy Clark. Thank you so much for joining us here on Making a Difference. I'm Melissa Billy Clark. We are here with Zen Sams. Zen is a model, a mentor, actress, media contributor, mom, and now the host of A Moment of Zen, which is such an incredible show. I've watched so many episodes. Thank you so much for doing this, uh, this, this uh, podcast and, and this uh, journalism. It's amazing. You have so many great people on. Uh, that is on WOR710 and iHeartRadio. We will also be featuring Zen in Preferred Health Magazine, and we are so thrilled and so grateful to have you. Zen, thank you so much for being here with us. Zen, as a professional and a mother, uh, how do you manage to juggle it all? I think it's, a, it, it's really about time management and being organized. Um, I literally live out of a calendar, and if my if everything isn't written down and things are not organized properly from not just one day before, but several days before, nothing would ever get done. Um, but I time manage and I set my priorities straight. And my priority is always my five and a half year old. Her name is Alexa. And although I have some help after school, I also work in my home and I have a remote studio there where I film and, and do all my podcasts and uh, appearances from. But the hard part is, is that she feels like she could just come in anytime she wants and open that door. And she's literally busted in on so many interviews, like high profile <laughs> interviews. And I'm like, oh my God, here we go, Alexa, bring your kid to work day. Um, but it's all about time management. So making sure that every priority in my life, like my daughter, my husband, uh, taking care of the house, making sure the dog is fed because I cook for him. His little yes. shih tzu. Uh, so it's, it's really just about managing it properly. And, and unfortunately, I can't just, you know, it's, I'm not like a last minute kind of uh, gal where you can say, hey, can you meet me for a quick drink like in an hour? It, based on where my life is at right now, and I think most moms, that's where their life is at right now, yeah. balancing work, balancing school. I could be, you know, I have a radio show, you have a radio or a TV show. I have a, another mother who's a book author. I have friends of mine who are partners at huge firms, uh, pediatricians, Supreme Court justices, right? Politicians, Amy Kennedy is a friend of mine. Yes. And the one thing every mom says that every successful working mom is, it's all about time management. If you have to live in blocks, that's the only way things get done. So I look at my calendar in the morning, I see where I find even that extra hour to spend with Alexa or even that extra 15 minutes to come down from my office and read her a book or interact with her. Um, so I think that's the, the most important thing, but not just for the family. Um, I prioritize work as up there with, uh, I, it's equal balance, right? So mm. a, a lot of moms feel guilty if they're putting their work before their families or vice versa. Sure. Uh, I like to equally balance it all out. I'm, I'm a big believer in balancing things effectively and karmically, it's always about the proper balance. So for me, I never, I'll always give my family uh, and my, my career almost uh, the same amount of time management, but I prioritize by making sure that the kids are taken care of, the dog is fed, hus husby's happy, the hubby's happy. Um, because, you know, <laughs> yeah. look, hubbies are babies too, if you don't pay attention to them. It's I true. Mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so true. Now, I read that Alexa is a child actor. She is. Wow. She's so how, how, how do you, what advice would you give to uh, parents wanting to get their children into acting? Young well, the, fir the first thing I would tell them is to head to the kids establishment.com. And it's, a, it's an organization that my partner and I, Melanie Amber Ruan, uh, she is a former talent agent. Uh, she discovered the Bella Thorns of the world. She then uh, transitioned from a talent agent and became a photographer in New Jersey, shooting beautiful portraits. Um, and she's, she's really super talented. When I met her, we came up with an idea her being a former agent, me being in the industry, really understanding the craft, understanding the marketing of things, and having a daughter who is uh, in a movie called Last Looks uh, with Mel Gibson that's going to be released later on in the year. Mm -hmm. um, sh so I just I decided to come up with a company called T Together. We co-founded the Kids Establishment, and the Kids Establishment 
dot com uh, or on Instagram at the kids establishment paves the way for exactly that child stars. But we are the safe arm to the parents who have all the questions who want to understand how to get your children in front of the camera safely, effectively to do it properly with the right marketing material, but also not just, you know, hey, I got scouted in a mall and then you ended up in a scam because that happens too. So of course, all making, the time. Right. So making sure that the parents are directly talking to myself and to Melanie Amber Ruan, who is my, my partner in this. And we pave the way for children to get represented by an agent to get to the next level. We also teach courses uh, on the weekend um, on our spare time because it's not enough that we are working mothers. I have a radio show and a TV show. She's out there, you know, huge photographer in New Jersey. She's actually on, uh, published as uh, one of the super moms in the May issue of 201 Bergen County. Um, so I love the fact cool. that you build other women up. I, I like that very much about you because that's what your show's about too. And you, and you, we need people like you to build other women as opposed to knocking them down. So thank you. <laughs> I just wanted Absolutely. to let you know I appreciate no, you. I am, I'm not going to say I'm a feminist of sorts because I love men in the same way that I love women. Sure. And I think that, that I am a visionary. I see us as equals, right? So I don't ever bow down to a man no more than I would bow down to a woman. Meaning again, about the balance. For me, it's all about equality. Yeah. I never, I, I'll never, I'll never see the glass half empty. I'll always, if anything, see it right in the middle, right? Half, half there or half full, but yeah. half full, right? So it's a matter of building each other up as women. And if we stood together the way men, the way men do, we could rule the world. I know Absolutely. that for a fact. Well, that was my next question. You know, um, Zen is a contributor on Newsmax. So how do you as a woman handle working with the majority of men? Well, I'm, I'm no longer. A, well, actually, that's not true. I, they, they, they'll, they'll still call upon me here and there. Sure. Um, other platforms do. But I started um, doing live Newsmax every Wednesday and every Friday in 2019 on a show called Liquid Lunch. Yes. John Tobacco's Liquid Lunch. And that's how I started. And he was in the yeah. city. And but he, and I said, well, why haven't you found somebody? I said, ha, being on the Newsmax platform, has that affected your, your, your dating hustle? I'm sure it did. Very right wing. And he's like, oh yeah. He's like, oh, yeah. he goes, they start off with, you're not some Trump supporter, are you? And he's like, oh, it's like going south from there. <laughs> and he's like, I, you know, I'm on Newsmax. What do you want me to do? Um, he's like, yeah. And then shame. it's like, I never hear from them again. He's like, how divisive are politics that it's evil, even trickling into everyday life, like the dating world. It's like, oh, you're a Republican, you're a Democrat. Well, but we can't be together based on our political views, which is so terrible. It's so bad. It's so bad. Yeah. You're lucky you're married. <laughs> But, uh, you know, I wanted to tell you, you're absolutely gorgeous uh, physically and beautiful inside as well, which counts even more. And on this show, we try to uh, build women up no matter what they look like. You know, uh, we're all gorgeous inside and outside. So I know that you had an injury. You fell outside of a restaurant and, uh, you know, you, you talk about how you have a crooked smile and you have to keep caring about that with Botox and what have you. So can you kindly tell our audience about what happened? And then we'll have a follow-up question with that, please. Sure. So back in 2012, I tripped and fell over a Con Edison wire cover and I literally broke my face. So yeah. it was, it was very kind of like, it happened one, two, three, four, five. I tripped, I fell onto a tree. I literally hugged the tree. My, my, my dentist, Dr. Mimi Young, always calls me a tree hugger. I was like, yeah, literally, no pun intended there. Sure. Um, and then I was rushed to Wild Cornell uh, with a facial fracture. And it was, uh, not only was it a facial fracture, I mean, it was like my face was out to there. I was gushing blood from my eyes, my nose, everywhere. And I have currently a metal plate under my orbital and four screws down my nasal passage. And it was Dr. Michael Stewart that performed the surgery at Wild Cornell. What an incredible surg surgeon he was. Not plastic surgeon, maxillofacial. Um, what they wow. basically did was flip my lip, like as if you would wow. flip your lip. 90 stitches were cut from basically like the base of my nostril internally all the way to the last tooth. And they placed it strategically, right, with laser. And they, they did everything guided, guided access. And then they sent me home with like a pack of Vicodin and Percocet. And they were like, wow. yeah, deal with it. And 
of course, I went to my neurologist and she said, look, you know, Vicodin and Percocet, they're nerve, in nerve inhibitors. Like if you just constantly take this, your nerves in your face right here in the area on the upper left area where I, I then had started to get a facial pull because after the swelling went down, the nerves were damaged underneath, right? And so I immediately switched from not having uh, any kind of Vicodin or Percocet, like literally trying to deal with the pain organically. And mm -hmm. in, try, in, in my search of trying to deal with the pain, I ended up using medicinal cannabis, uh, which literally saved my face. And I'll tell you how. So separate of the severe inflammation and the emotional repercussions it was having on yeah. me, but also the nerve twitches and the spasms I would have. My face was numb. I couldn't feel one side. Um, you know, there was scar tissue underneath my, my, uh, my lips, right? So it was hard for me to even eat. It was, it felt weird. Uh, but what happened was I started using derma patches, oils, edibles for the swelling, for the inflammation, uh, for even just the mental ramifications of having this kind of trauma, this trauma done on, on your face as a, as a model and it who makes her money with her face. It was kind of, uh, it wasn't, a, it wasn't about vanity. It was more about, okay, well, I can't work now. I can't do anything. Right. Sure. So it was a slow process. The recovery was hard. My face didn't really come back to formation uh, till at least three months the swelling took to go down, but I never had to use any kind of painkiller. And what I ended up realizing was that my nerves bounced back without any major issues, except a slightly crooked smile. So when I smile, now it's even. Right? It's, it's an even smile. It's a but beautiful smile. But sometimes when when the nerves bounce back to normal and are not under the influence of Botox. Yes. And so what that means is, and I'm going to use my little pen to show you, the doctor literally drops one drop of Botox there mm -hmm. to basically lower the, 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 the smile when the smile is lifted and my smile is crooked. You know what I mean? Interesting. So, so they basically, it's like a seesaw. So she, she kills, um, doc, it's her name is Sari Katz. She's really good. She's a concierge service called Velour Medical, but she's also, you could check her out on Instagram um, at Skin by Sari. Um, and she, you could research her. She's amazing. So she's an injector, but I'm not eligible to get fillers on my face and really like injectables. I'm not uh, because of the metal I have, it has to be done under supervision, really good sure. care. Another really good doctor is Dr. Elliot Heller. He's an amazing plastic surgeon. Although he hasn't worked plastic surgery on my face, he's really good with, uh, I've seen what he does, reconstruct, uh, reconstructive surgery, rhinoplasty, things of that nature. He has a company called Allure um, Plastic Surgery uh, up on the Upper East Side and Jersey and Staten Island. The reason I'm talking about these people is because they have, they were the ones of their likes, not they, but specifically Sari and plastic surgeons like Dr. Elliot Heller are the ones that could be, that could figure out where this Botox needs to be dropped yes. to even out the smile. So even if somebody had a stroke, for instance, yes. and they had a crooked smile, it's a treatment that you use to even out the, the nerves and the muscles. Now, a lot of plastic surgeons say we would never inject in that area. It's very, very difficult and they wouldn't. But in my case, you know, with an, with a pull and a twitch, there was no choice. And if you over inject, then you get a droopy smile. So it's like, it's, it's almost like a point of a 2% that they have to do. You, you almost can't even quantify it to charge it. That's how little of Botox I'm, is needed to even out my smile, but it's, Thanks to technology, thanks to doing research, thanks to me figuring things out on my own and, and collaborating with the most incredible individuals in New York that are professional yeah. medicals, I was able to, to literally find a solution to, to get my appearance back to where it was before. Um, and I'm not eligible to get like the regular fillers in like the area where you can lift your cheeks right. because again, right. one cheek is metal, like it interacts, it swells, right? So I got I to gotta make sure that I keep this for as long as I can. Which I is, know. Which it's pretty that? it's pretty amazing that they do this you know i'd like for you to hook us up with this uh so i can talk to them because maybe they can help with bell palsy people who have strokes in their face my question to you is how can someone cope in an injury that changed their life forever because your life is forever changed so what advice do you give to them right so the scars uh you know people say you know the scars although i don't wear the scar my scars are not external they are internal and those yes. scars will live with me forever but it's about taking a negative and turning it into a positive it's about you get 
you know, lemons, you make lemonade. Um, and God has a plan for everybody. So for me, it was, it was about finding the silver lining. And that meant that in my time of healing and recovery away from modeling and the camera, uh, and I, 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 at the time I didn't have Alexa, right? She wasn't born yet, but it allowed me to reflect within and really kind of figure out my next path, which was really focused on not just modeling, but TV and film and, mm -hmm. and really kind of my career took off um, because as a result of going through this kind of trauma, it was like a reset. It was almost like, all right, there's a chapter behind you and now there's a chapter in front of you. And so having coped with your face being broken, having coped with, you know, your nerves not functioning well, having coped with so much uh, emotional, mental and internal pain because, you know, you, you wake up every day and you're like, I don't know if this face will ever bounce back because again, the swelling was so bad. And now looking back, you know, of course, there's, there's plenty of methods, even if in the worst case scenario, there's plastic surgery and they could fix almost anything, right. but it caused a lot of trauma to my teeth, right? So I had to work with Dr. Young, who was able to make sure that the, la the last tooth had to be extracted and two in the back, more than one tooth had to be extracted. They had to replace them with implants. Then they had to make sure that, you know, it didn't hit the nerve. Sometimes when I chew too much on the left, it kind of, I feel my face kind of move, which is weird, but I, it's, a, it's a true feeling. And when it gets too cold outside and I'm on the ski slopes, I also feel my face freezing. Sure, sure. So we're, we're so sorry that you have to go through this and uh, we'll keep you in our prayers with, you know, with the healing. And thank you for giving that advice to people uh, of how to stay positive in, an, in a situation that they're put in. Uh, so I enjoyed. And the ultimate goal is the, the show is likely going to be syndicated nationwide very soon. Uh, and we're going to have not just one, the moment of Zen, but sub shows because of the, the amount of sponsors I work with. And the sponsorship pool is huge. I work with the Ocean uh, Casino Resort in Atlantic City. They are our main sponsor. Wow. Re Revere Securities. Uh, Kyle Wool is the principal there. They are another main sponsor. I'm working with... Uh, Helen Yarmack Furs, which is another showroom in the city, fine furs, high-end jewelry. Uh, Biche Cucina is another sponsor, and the beaches are everywhere. And we thank you for the change that you're making um, on radio and, uh, and with your people. So thank you so much. Please head over to uh, zensams.com to find out more information on her. So thank you, Zen, and uh, we'll talk soon. You're so welcome. Thank you so much for having thank me. You. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Hi, I'm Melissa Billy Clark, and on this episode of Making a Difference, we speak with Lawrence Chow, an award-winning journalist, host, actor, writer, producer, filmmaker, and if you're into ghostly documentaries such as I am, that's what we talk about all the time on this show, <laughs> you can head over to Amazon Prime to watch him host Ghostly Encounters. I'm obsessed with that show. I'm obsessed with you when you come on and host it. You're amazing. So excited to have oh, you. Goodness. I've been waiting for this so much. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you for having me. You look amazing. Thank I'm you. I'm so impressed with your setup. <laughs> Thank you so <laughs> much. We mean, we mean business here on Making a Difference. Now, I wanted to have you um, on this program, not only to promote your brilliance, you know, you're an amazing person in journalism. You are one of the writers, um, and it hits so close to home here in New York City. There is a short film called mm -hmm. Justice for Vincent. Uh, it's based on a true story of a Chinese American, Vincent Chin, who was brutally murdered by two Caucasian men in 1982. He was only 27 years old. His story actually sparked the first civil rights movement for Asian Americans. Take a look. $3,000 and three years probation. Half the price of a shiny new car in the Motor City. Is that what the life of a Chinese man an American citizen is worth? When I saw this film, it angered me because of the sentence they received. Tell us what these two men received. Lawrence, please. 
well, just to preface a bit, it was um, uh, Detroit, 1982. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was at a time when the um, American auto industry was um, feeling the from the Japanese automotive industry. Yes. A lot of, you know, unemployment yes. and competition. Uh, so there was a, a backdrop of racial animosity uh, mm -hmm. towards Japanese imports. And Mids and Chin, however, was Chinese. Um, but with a lot of uh, racial incidents, it, they don't nitpick at oh, Asian, Japanese, Vietnamese whatever, Asian is Asian. So an incident occurred at a bar brawl um, near Detroit where uh, a couple of um, disenfranchised auto workers uh, argumentatively, but, you know, uh, had a far, uh, bar brawl with Vincent Shin and um, it's believed that uh, the, the, him being Japanese, Asian, Chinese, whatever, was kind of like the basis for his um, murder. Uh, and uh, they were let off with uh, uh, three months, three years probation and a $3,000 and $3, fine. So it's that sparked, yeah, yeah that sparked the movement. Uh, Ronald Evans, who's actually 81 years old now, I checked it and he's still alive. Um, he actually said uh, in the brawl, it's because of you people that were out of work. So that was mm -hmm. actually considered a racial um, uh, violence. Yeah. So when the, you know, went to, when they were put in jail for, for the date, the date of the arrest, but when mm -hmm. it came to the sentence, uh, the state, uh, court, the judge just gave them a three month, three year probation and a $3,000 fine. And that angered the Asian community, the Chinese community. And that's galvanized um, the movement. And it's kind of like the first time that the Asian American community uh, banded together uh, in protest. And it was, you know, Chinese Americans and Japanese Americans, Korean Americans, Vietnamese, all coming together, yeah. along with uh, Caucasians. And, and even Jesse Jackson came on board to decry this uh, injustice. So that's 1982. And sadly, we see that happening now with uh, the pandemic. Um, the need mm -hmm. into racism and scapegoating. Um, so it, the strange thing is that I wrote and produced and acted in Justice of Vincent. This, we shot that in 19, um, sorry, in 2018, mm -hmm. uh, pre-COVID. Uh, and people, and I wrote it around 2016. They go, how did you know? I, I, I didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't yeah. Know that the way the country was moving um, that with so much racial animus, I felt that the Asian community would be targeted next somehow. You know, it was started with um, post-election, there were post-2016 election, you know, there was the uh, Hispanics, uh, Muslims, uh, African-Americans, Jewish, and I said, oh, we're going to be next. You and felt that coming along? Instinctually, I felt that. And then, wow. sadly, um, COVID uh, hit, and now we see so many uh, Asian hate crimes uh, throughout the country. And, and you see the parallel, right? It's not just the disease, it's the um, scapegoating, it's the racial component of it, and, and the economic disenfranchisement, whether it was the auto industry in 1982 or whether it was the economic impact of, that COVID, COVID has had on people. So this fuels a sense of um, anger, I think, and scapegoating. And unfortunately, some people uh, take it out physically, violently. No. It's a shame. No. Yeah, we've seen that a lot here in New York City. It's kind of dying down right now, which is fantastic. We're not hearing, yeah, we're not hearing about it as much, uh, but it is just, it's, it's horrible when somebody's just walking down the street and they're just getting ostracized of, because of who they are. So we're going to talk about that in a minute, um, but I want to get back to this film because it really uh, was amazing and very well put. So thank you for putting this together and bringing awareness and light uh, to this to this, uh, to this situation. So now, and it makes you think of the judicial system uh, and how we can go wrong. So now in this film, you play the, fil the family's attorney. Is that right? Uh, kind of like a civil rights actor, it's not an okay. attorney. Okay, so these men were caught red-handed. Uh, they were detained by the police on the scene. This act was in fact a hate crime because of we just spoke about how Ronald, is his name Ronald? 
Uh, yeah, we use a fictional name in the film. Um, oh, you use a fictional name. Okay, so so Ronald Evans, he was one of the murderers. I mean, you could find it on the internet, uh, who is mm -hmm. 81 years old today. So uh, he did say a hate crime. It's because of you people that we were out of work because they were in the auto, the auto industry. So this film was released in 2019, and we started having hate crimes this year in 2021. Um, have you had your community reach out to you and express their thoughts on their feelings about the situation uh well it, it's um you know with, uh, with social media i'm quite in the loop with uh all the hate crimes and you know I, i'm part of some anti uh hate groups and anti-asian hate groups and stuff like that um and you know it, it, there's a universal or collective um I, I can't even find the right word um upset, uh, disgusting, <laughs> disappointed sure, and, sure. Uh, in any uh, adjective you want to say. So yeah. yeah, you know, it's, it's very disappointing. Uh, I think it's a sign of the times. It's a sad, sadly, because I think um, there is a shift in society where um, hate is almost um, has been legitimized or reignited. And these are very tense racial times. We see it with, uh, you know, George Floyd and a lot of the African American um, uh, killings, you know, whether it's by cops or whatever, we've seen it with the desecration of um, uh, Jewish synagogues and places of worship, um, burial grounds, um, you know, the racial animus towards um, Hispanics because of you know what's happening at also the border, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So. I think it's a sign of the times. But back to your question. Uh, yeah, I think uh, the interesting thing about um, our little short film, I, I made it a, pretty much as a declaration of anti-hate. That was my hope of, of doing it, right? And our message was simple, that a mother's loss is a mother's loss. Hate is hate, injustice is injustice. And it's across the board. And in, in the end of our film, we, did, we pay homage to other hate crime victims like Matthew Shepard, um, uh, Trayvon Martin, and I recently updated the film to include George Floyd and the Atlanta shoot, uh, shootings and things that are happening with the Asian community with COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I don't know. I, I just don't know where we're going to go as a society from here. I know as people are getting vaccinated and the cases are coming down and hopefully there's going to be less um, violence, but it's like once the seed of racism is planted and that fire is lit, it's really hard to extinguish. It okay. kind of just simmers. And it's now it's, it went from simmering to kind of, you know, uh, searing. Uh, and I don't know, I really don't know. Um, what's next, you know, is, is any crisis, are we gonna react like this? You know, yeah. how, you know can you imagine like, 80s, 90s, AIDS, if everyone's being attacked. I, I don't know. I just don't get it. I just don't know where we're going to go. I, I don't know. It feels what, like. What would you tell those who still feel upset and worried about who they are? I mean, they have to walk around and enjoy their life. And, you know, what, what would you tell them? What advice would you give to them? For anybody who gets ostracized for who they are. I hope that um, as a society that um, understanding and compassion leads the way. Um, you know, this is such a hard question uh, to answer because how do you, there's no logic to racism. But you're also an influencer and you are out there and people do admire your work um, and especially, you know, your community. So thank you for everything that you do and making a difference. You raise a lot of, uh, you know, attention and flags to this. Uh, so, I mean, there are possibly a, a, a feature film, there might be a TV series, a lot of projects are in development. And I can say that, well, we were the first. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe, of course. Maybe you were a catalyst for that. I don't know. Uh, and I'm happy, but, and I think they will take it to another level. And I have to say, you know, ours isn't inspired by um, adaptation. So, you know, we made uh, dramatic uh, creative embellishments um, to tell our story because in 15 minutes, you really do have to <laughs> you know, change a few things here and there. But however, we stay true to them, you know, 
the gist of the story and, and its message. So, and so you're, you know, you're out there seeking um, distribution. You really want to turn this into uh, something really big, and it can be. You know, uh, we broadcast it uh, last uh, it, back in May. Uh, mm -hmm into a bit of June uh, during Asian American Pacific Islander Month, AEI Month, um, as a con contribution during, that was a time also a lot of the Asian hate crimes with COVID were going on and, you know, I put it out there. And the feedback has been very strong. Um, however, uh, and maybe we'll get it distributed too, that's in, on the table now, so your, view, your viewers can look out for that. I'll keep people updated on my social media. Please do. Yeah, I would have loved to have done it on to, into the next level, like a feature film, but there's just so many other, um, you know, entities who are far, carry far more cachet than I do. And I think, you know, they would probably be able to do it, uh, you know. And uh, Helen Zia, one of the um, prime activists uh, who was involved in the case, uh, she's doing her TV series too. So, and I met with her during, you know, when I did my film and stuff like that. So all the power to them. What would you tell a new writer who wants to bring a true life story to life? That's, that's gotta be pretty hard because you gotta make sure you have everything accurate, quotes and everything. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's, okay. If you're gonna do a true, true, true life story, you know, based on, on, on something historical or whatever, uh, that is a whole different beast in itself because yes, your research and thing, it has to be very accurate and your mess, you, what you're writing, the dialogue has to be very accurate. Yep. Uh, and then you come in, the other way to do it is to do a based on a true story, which is based on it, but however, change things here and there. And then there's the other level, which is an inspired by a true story, which is what JFV is, which is um, truth, the essence of truth and elements of truth, but yet more creative liberty to, you know, massage things and things like, for example, my character as a civil rights activist, um, mm -hmm. there is no Henry Lee. It was a complex character and it encapsulated um, Helen Zia, who I had mentioned earlier, uh, and there was a bunch of male um, activists more in the background that people don't know about. Um, you know, so, you know, that's what I mean by if you do an inspired by a true story, you can create these more um, fluid, uh, creative uh, components that aren't necessarily true, true, true to the story. You know, like Selma, for example, about Martin Luther King, everyone thinks it's a straightforward biopic pet mm -hmm. rooted in total and most of it is however it was hugely fictionalized because the king family wasn't involved with the with the story um and and uh david duvernay created the script you know but it was rooted in truth so it's you know it's a it's a bit technical you're coming into the realm of screen screen uh screenwriting to learn what you're doing having said that uh, you sh if it's um, kind of like a legal type uh, story, you should definitely get uh, legal advice on, on, on sure. what so you're if it's, changing. So, your sorry, sorry. Like you have to stay true to the story. You have to stay true to the facts, you know. Okay, so maybe it wasn't a female, uh, it was a male. Maybe the person wasn't Asian or, and you use someone who was African-American. Those things are generally, you know, you can pass as long as what happened and what, you know, they said are true. So. Wow. So if you're seeing a story that it's based and it says based on a true story and they're, they, they could you know be that there's <clears throat> film actors and everything. Okay. That's interesting. <coughs> Excuse yeah. me. Most of uh, a lot of the Hollywood script you see in the movie, right? Um, you know, based on a true story. They, it's based on a true story. It's, you know, look at, for example, the crown. It doesn't even say true or, you know, based on her spire. It's just the crown. But come on, do you think Queen Elizabeth sat down with the writers and said, here, here, no, those guys, they made it up, you know, but based yeah. on truth or rooted in truth. And it's their creative interpretation. Halston, right now on Netflix, based on the passion to learn yeah. Halston, Ryan Murphy did it. You know, uh, the, the family wasn't consulted and they, researched it and pieced it all together and the writers this is their creative vision creative interpretation of what happened based on truth 
Interesting. So that's how a lot of comedy productions get done, you know? So well, it's, it's that- really hard to do. Mm. Yeah, sorry. We're getting all technical now. People are like, what are you talking about? <laughs> are you a writer, Melissa? Is that what- I am a writer. <laughs> Um, I wish this, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I wish this film was still out, but you did have it out for a significant, um, a great amount of time. Uh, but uh, we did show the trailer, so thank you for bringing that uh, to life. And um, and just, it, it's an amazing uh, little short. Uh, so, when did you start your career in journalism? Oh God. Um... <laughs> <laughs> you don't want me to date myself. Huh? Pretty almost two decades. Uh, I'm from Toronto, Canada. Yeah. Uh, I went to journalism school, and I knew that I wanted to uh, do more TV film. That was always a dream, right? But you can't really sell that to Asian parents. Right? <laughs> journalism was bad enough. <laughs> oh my god! Like I'm going to be film school. What? Or you know, <laughs> no, 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 radio, television. No, no, no. Yeah. Journalism sounds even respectable. So I, I went that route and I uh, was good at it, um, but harbored the passion for entertainment through it all. And um, I remember being so depressed and miserable uh, in my graduating year. I'm like, I don't want to be a hard news journalist. And I love it. But, and, you know, I'm political junkie, news junkie myself, but I just can't do this for the rest of my life. Uh, I want to do entertainment. So the teacher yeah. said, there's nothing wrong with parlaying your journalism degree and your skills into something you love, which is journalism. So yeah. that's what I did. I went off to um, Hong Kong mm-hmm. uh, and I, uh, I, I led two careers there. First, a public relations. Uh, I was a consultant, which I also did in high school, which also requires journalism. Yeah. Uh, and I landed a TV job on the side uh, hosting. And then Singapore came along and... Um, uh, I landed uh, Showbuzz, which is like their entertainment tonight. And I kind of became like the Ryan Seacrest, <laughs> where That's I was um, interviewing. Right? You, you worked in Hong Kong, is that right? Yeah, Hong Kong and then Singapore. And Singapore was when it really poof, exploded. And I was like traveling the world, interviewing, you know, Denzel Washington, Hugh Jackman, Halle Berry, awesome. Michelle. It was crazy, uh, you know. Tom Cruise, I was emceeing his press conference, you know, things like that. It was, it was a wild ride in Singapore. And at the same time, I was producing the show and writing it. Yeah. Uh, and then um, I was also act, I started to act on the side. Uh, so I didn't sleep for a good 10 years. <laughs> and then I went back to Canada uh, and thought I would take a break. And then my parents got sick and stuff like that. So I, I, I started to take care of them. I'm sorry, did that ring? Uh, and um, are your parents still around? Uh, mom is gone. After I did JFV and we did the film festival route, uh, I had a good ride, and I thought, okay, maybe we'll get a fe- feature or whatever. And then my brother sadly passed away, so I'm I had so to take. Sorry. I had to take a total uh, year off. He had a heart attack unexpectedly, so I had to, you know, base back in Toronto for a while and take care of family stuff and dad's. We took- kind of- we talk a lot about grief on this program. Um, how did you handle your grief uh, losing a sibling and your mama? Oh, not well. <laughs> um, mom was especially hard because um, uh, she was very ill uh, and when I, around kindergarten, her health took a major nosedive and I became sort of like her caretaker at the age of five. Wow. Um, latchkey kid made my own snacks after school. She was just too ill. And, um, but, and I grew up very old, very fast. You know, I had to do, yeah. <clears throat> to go to the doctor, help go to ph- do pharmacy runs, banking things. So I took care of her a lot. And then in JFV, um, I played like the civil rights activist helping Vincent's mom, Lily Chin. And I didn't even notice, I, well, first of all, I, I didn't expect to play that role. I was going to play Vincent Chin. But, you know, the casting things, issues happen. So I ended up doing that role. Mm-hmm. And the role, my acting coach was like, you know, you have to dig deep why you're doing, you're stepping into that role as a civil rights activist. And it dawned on me. And I wrote it. I didn't even notice that it was because in the civil activist, civil activist was kind of like the Lily Chin's, protector in the film and I go that's my real life I was my mom's protector so when she passed um 
It was, it was really hard because she passed away in my arms alone at the hospital. And it's really hard. It, You're you going to get I, me going. I had the same yeah. thing. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It, it, it's brutal. We, yeah. we, you know, because she brought you into the world and mm. you as a baby. And then when it comes full circle moment. Yeah. And, and to lose a life in your arms and the last breath. And, you know, it's to this day, it's, it haunts me. And I, you know, I, I don't know if it's PTSD, but there are, you know, it, 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 it sticks with you. And I still have dreams. It's been 10 years. I still have dreams. Wow. Yeah. Um, and my brother was unfortunate because, you know, he wasn't old. He wasn't, he didn't sleep, did he say? Um, he had a lot of issues too. And it happened unexpectedly because uh, it was during, I wrote, almost like wrapping up the film festival run for the justice for Vincent JFA. And I was like, Oh, catch my breath, catch my breath. It, it was like a scene from saving private Ryan when the two cops show up at your door and you just know it's like this, everything's slow motion. And, and they said, um, are you Lawrence Shaw? I said, yes. You know, um, are you the brother of you know, so-and-so? And I said, yes. And I said, sad news, uh, he passed away in Toronto. So I had to drop everything and fly back and go there for, you know. So and, and, and I this had was a lot. quite recently then, huh? Quite recently? Yeah, you know, a few months. And it, it was a lot of stuff because <laughs> he, so, he, was, he was kind of like a warder. So yeah, it was, you know, I can't say that. Um, yeah, anyway, it was, it, was, it was heavy. It was heavy. So it was like, um, and then COVID, it was during COVID too. Yeah. So you know, you're flying through a pandemic. What did he pass away from, Lawrence, if you don't? Yeah, uh, plaque in his heart. He had a heart attack. You see? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, I don't know. Um, yeah, so, you know, we had to take care of, I, you know, when my mom passed and my brother passed, it, I had to take care of business. You know, it was me, you know, so. So you're still was, having a tough time with all this, um, Mentally, um, and with your father being I, sick, I'm, I'm not quite a. I'm a very resilient kind of person, and I'm very level-headed. And, you know, when there's a crisis, as as emotionally um, sad and you know upsetting it is, I'm very much in control. You know, I can still <laughs> organize and yeah. organize the funeral and do this and do that. And uh, I'm just um, tired. Like it's physical burnout. And I, there hasn't been a moment where I can just like decompress. It's been like, when you're traveling the film festival circuit for two years from city to city, you're not sleeping. And yeah, then suddenly you... your brother died, you have to fly back and you have to, you know, purchase condo, go through the state, deal with legal, deal with financial and all these things and taxes. And they're like, oh. <laughs> and then it's, a lot it's like. to handle. Yeah, it's a lot. Do you have faith? That, like, what do you have faith? Like, do you um, believe in anything that you know that you're not doing this on your own? Or I'm not actively uh, religious per se, but I I am very spiritual. You know, okay. And I kind of have this thing where um, I'm, I'm often called to service. <laughs> if like I'm on, I seem to be on people's speed dial during crises. They or, call you. Yeah, I'm always the one. Oh, geez. <laughs> I don't know. And I'm, I don't know. I've, I don't know. I'm, <laughs> That's you know, tough. I'm, it's God awful. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. it's cool. No. I'm like, are you possibly like me? You walk into a room and you can gauge the energy. Oh, yeah. You don't need it to happen and something is either good or not good. Oh, yeah. I can this feel. Person, yeah. I'm the same. This person's vibe is just. <clears throat> I need to leave. Once I start having that feeling and just the way they're looking at me and I can see, because I'm not just looking at their eyes, I'm looking inside, I'm looking around them. I can see their aura. It's, yeah. um, it's kind this of weird. And it actually yeah, it happened more after my parents died. So now it's just like, I'm a weirdo at home by myself with my dogs. <laughs> are you really? Yeah. Well, they even say that people who are more, uh, empathic, um, or kind of like dog whispers, if they, you can sense what the dogs, some oh, people yeah. don't, they can't even tell. I go, like, I'll go and like, um, your dog's got this issue here. And they're like, they're, what are you talking about? And they go, oh my God, you're right. <laughs> I go, awesome. do you know whenever we come over and your dog eats? 
and the bow's not touched when no one's around, he's happy, he's eating. They go, yeah. oh God, I had a dog for 10 years. So what is the most important part of your career? Because you do so much. So what's mm. the most important part of your career? The most you important part. Oh shit, that's the well. Yes, it's <laughs> questions. <laughs> it's afternoon on East Coast. It's morning here in LA. <laughs> What's the most important? That's a, I don't know what the most important is, but I know that I uh, I love uh, acting and hosting. I love because it comes very naturally to me. You're very good at it. You're very good at it. Very Thank good you. at it. Yeah, I've seen a couple of your clips on YouTube. If you head over to uh, YouTube, you can watch uh, Lawrence Chow, C-H-A-U. And mm. he's very good at what he does. So, mm. good. Uh, I have a feeling as I get older, <laughs> 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 maybe the writing will be the most important. I don't know. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I was uh, a major host in Asia, it was like you were able to reach so many people. and. You know, I would say that was my most important thing is I'm touching, affecting people. Yes, yes, that's exactly what you're doing. I don't know. As I turn this new leaf in life, uh, and, you know, I don't know, maybe it's the writing. We'll see. Yeah. I don't know. Cool. So what do you have coming up? Anything coming up this year? Um, well, having gone through what I went through, I'm just going to kind of go quiet like you for a while, yeah. um, retreat from the scene. And um, I want to explore these other products I have in terms of writing. We're very sorry for what you went through uh, with your mom and your brother. And, um, you know, we just keep praying that you're going to, you're going to get out, you know, be all right. <laughs> you're going to be okay. I can see it. And you can check out Lawrence on the cover of EGO magazine and follow him. So that I'm not, I'm not okay. vain. They actually sent me this. Ah, I love it. Handsome. And follow him on his social media, Lawrence Chow Act. And we thank you so much. Honor to have you on the program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to Making a Difference. I'm your host, Melissa Billy Clark. If you'd like to learn more about our show, please visit our website at melissabillyclarkshow.com. If you'd like to sponsor or be a guest, email melissa at melissaclark.com.